So just to remind us, we've, we've, we've gone over this huge whirlwind tour of Julia, the syntax, functions, types, um, it's more syntax, so much more syntax, try and catching. Um, and so last time we were talking about the different types there were, remember we had primitive types, which are how you define things like integers and floating point numbers. You won't need to create those. Um, structs, so this is how you like put a few bits of data together in some organized structure. So if things have names, things have types. Um, so you can create things like a complex number out of two real numbers, for example. Um, um, and then the other concrete types, which are sort of built in like array and string tuple. Um, these things are built in Julia. So basically mutable structs, primitive types, not mutable structs, tuple strings and arrays are all the types that you can use in Julia. Um, and from them, we're going to build up our programs. Um, so that's where your data gets stored, but you can organize them into a tree or a hierarchy of, of abstract types. And that's, we're going to practice that today. That's what we're going to play with actually using abstract types and creating generic functions. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, like the, the types form this sort of tree structure. So the number type has a whole bunch of, um, child types like complex dual numbers, real numbers, real, there's a whole bunch of real numbers implemented in Julia, like, um, abstract floats which might have like these concrete types and then this one which is an arbitrary kind of sized floating point number um and there's all these different types of integers signed unsigned the boolean which is like a uint one that kind of thing okay so there's abstract types which define this tree e each of these types might have a type parameter so that's sort of another kind of thing kind of abstraction over a set of types that you might have. And there's union types, which are like, if you have two things or three things, you know, you can create a union. So that's just sort of like a recap of where we were. And the last bit we looked at was creating just a type, just showing you if you want to create a struct, you want to populate it, you want to use it, do things with it. We just had an example of like a person. So imagine you have some kind of database of people um, with heights and weights and names. Um, well, we can create a struct for each person with their height and weight and name. Um, we can put create a person called Miriam here, um, and we can populate the fields. And like, you know, obviously to get a field out of a thing, you just use this dot syntax. And if it's mutable, you can also put an equal sign on the right hand and kind of mutate it. All right. So um, because this one's not mutable, when we try that, it errors. But we could have just put a mutable there instead and made it mutable. All right. Um, so let's go beyond just people and let's start thinking about whole families of different types of animals. Okay. So we have like the whole animal kingdom. We could have plants and funguses and all sorts of things if we felt like it. But um, let's just start with animals. Um, so there's different types of animals. Here we're going to deal with mammals and reptiles. You know, we could have birds and fish if we wanted. Um, so, and that's the thing about this is, is this isn't a closed system is that you could take a module code written like this and you can always add new subtypes to animal later on. Okay. So Julia won't really let you redefine float 64 and, and do what you want with it. It'll sort of throw an error so that it's already a type. You can't, you can't redefine it. It'll break everything because that's a concrete type, right? But you can always extend an abstract type and create more children in this sort of tree of types. Um, so like before, humans might have height, weight, and names. Uh, we might have dogs, um, and we've forgotten their names. Um, and then we've got this type. Here's an example of a flex dog. So it's a bit, it's like a dog. It's a more flexible data structure um, in that it has this type parameter T. So remember, so T, T is meant to be a type. It, to create a flex dog, you have to know what T is. So maybe it could be a float 32 instead of a float 64, for example. Um, and then the height would be a T, maybe a float 32, and the weight would be the same type. And all of this thing is still a subtype of mammal, right? Um, and you can even have these type parameters on the abstract type too, so that could also appear on the right-hand side there, potentially. Um, um, so dog and flex dog are very similar, except for the fact that 
you know, you can actually change the type of the data inside. So like as a programmer, I could write a library function and not know what kind of concrete types you want to use because, for example, if you're doing some heavy numerics, you might want to run it on a graphics card that might be a lot better to run with Float32 than Float64, for example, because it's graphics cards, you know, they were made for gamers. Float32 is good enough for games uh, and gamers just want their pixels to appear fast, you know, so they, they use smaller data types, the implementer, the NVIDIA and AMD, they, have, they can use less transistors on the graphics card. Um, they can make less heat. They can run them at high frequencies by doing these sort of things. Okay. So when you care about performance, often you'll find like library code or generic code will have a lot of type parameters. And when you're finally, and that, and when you're finally an end user, you don't want to like create generic code. You want to create concrete code, right? You want to create a program to do something that you care about. And that's when you start populating them. You have a, a vector of float 64s or something, you know. Um, and we've got another type of croctile, crocodile, which is a type of reptile. Um, and there could be like different types of crocodiles, for example. Um, we've got this symbol type here. So just to remind everyone what a symbol is, just briefly, because it will come up from time to time. You don't necessarily have to use it a lot yourself, but you'll see it in APIs and things. Um, a symbol is like a string, but it's a string that the compiler knows about. And the compiler, they say you've, the compiler has interned the string. So it's kept, it keeps a cache of all these strings in like a hash map or something, some kind of dictionary or set of, of these strings. And um, if you, and this symbol is like pointing, is a pointer, so it's a 64-bit object on my computer that points to this string. Okay, so everywhere I use a symbol, I don't have to keep this string of unknown length. You know, that could be like hundreds of characters long, theoretically, a string, right? So it could be megabytes long, could be gigabytes long. Um, so instead, we just have this pointer to this thing that the compiler has kept in this cache for us, right? And then that's the same cache the compiler uses to know words like crocodile and stuff. So somewhere in there is a, going to be a symbol in the compiler called crocodile. And every time you use that symbol, it's going to not like repeat that string. It's just going to use a pointer to this crocodile in this hash map. And it doesn't have to duplicate the strings everywhere. And that's, so that's this thing with this thing written out the front. So just to be clear, these can be any kind of strings. So we could have like the symbol A, but I could also construct them from a string like that. And you get the same thing. Okay. So, and that lets us do things like put spaces in variables, like normally with the colon syntax, it should be like a, an identifier or like a variable name kind of string, but if it has spaces, that's not allowed normally. Or you, you'll see the Julia compiler will do lots of things internally and use strings like that, because that's the comment symbol. So you can't normally type that as a user. So it uses that for some internal kind of symbols and, and stuff um, when it's, manipulating the expressions. Um, okay, so we've got these types, the human, dog, flex dog, and crocodile. So let's have a look at this. We've got this abstract animal type with a child mammal type and reptile types, okay? And from there we have cats, dogs, flex dogs, and humans, which are all mammals. And we have a single reptile, which is crocodiles. Now remember later on, we could add lizards and, and you know, cat and, and other kinds of things later, right? Uh, oh, this is interesting. Cat wasn't meant to appear here, but it did. It's fascinating. We're going to define cat later. That's like a little bit of a sneak preview. Okay, so um, what we've done here, we've created a, a type, crocodile, which has created like an object in Julia. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's a type in itself. There's a, like a single type of crocodile. And for every type of object, you can attach methods to it in Julia. So even a function like the sign function, for example, let's say the sign function in Julia, um, it has its own sign, its own type, right? And like the type of sign isn't the same as the type of cos, for example, that's not true. And for every type, you can attach methods to it. So you can go methods of sign and we'll see a bunch. Um, Mostly the ones you'll use is probably just this first one where it's like sign of a float 32 or float 64, in which case it'll just probably uh, defer. I think historically it used to defer to some C function. I think they're implemented in Julia now in this code, um, you know, native Julia code. Um, 
and this kind of thing. But you can also take the sign of a complex number and get a complex number and stuff. So this is where in Julia, you get to overload existing functionality with new concepts like the sign of complex numbers. Um, even if the person who first implemented sign was only considering real numbers. Okay. So for any, any type, so including one of these types, or, or when you go function F or whatever, it creates a new type for F. Any of those have what's called a method table, which is basically an array of methods, right? Um, so it, um, why have we got three methods for crocodile? Did we, this is interesting where this rendered. So by default, you should get this one, these ones maybe. Um, and then we've got this extra one uh, defined down here. So for some reason, when this rendered Yoni, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. There's a story behind this. So you only just said he actually sort of compiled it and compiled it again. Maybe there's a typo to fix or something was it? Yeah. Yeah. So we've so this this document that we we're looking at um, is actually uh, like a markdown file. I don't know if you, if you don't know what markdown is, it doesn't matter. It's like a text file, and you type in blocks of code and blocks of text and blocks of code and blocks of text. And for each block of code written in Julia, um, it'll compile it and run it. And and then what it does, it's, it figures out what the output is, like you know, watch the standard out or something, and then puts it in there. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day, it renders it all as HTML. And that's how we're doing these lecture notes. And most of the unit notes are like this. Um, and so what's happened is it's ran once, it's defined all the functions and methods and types, and then it's ran again, and it's gone through, and, and we can see it from the first run, which is why, for example, there's cat here and why there's this thing here. But basically, by default, when you define um, a struct, you'll get a constructor for free. Okay, so um, there's obviously this one. So this is like, if you give it exactly a float 64, float 64 and a symbol, it will, that fits into this struct and it will construct it for you. Okay, so that's like a default one that comes with the struct that you'd expect to work always. And then it defines this one, which is a bit more abstract. So if you give it say the length and weight as float 32s, it will actually, this, this method will actually um, convert those float 32s to float 64s for you and then stick it into the struct. So that's just like a little bit of user friendliness. Um, again, we were talking about syntax sugar the other day. If you we look here, they both point to line 24 of this code block. So if you count down, this is like line 24 here, I think. Um, and uh, what, what it's done is when it sees one of these, the compiler actually in the background adds functions and methods methods to, to this type for you by default. And you can override them and stuff. It's sort of advanced stuff. You don't really need to know about that. Um, but it will construct those two, the sort of simple one, which just takes the things and the more complicated one, which converts it, takes inputs and converts them to what they should be. Um, now, obviously it might be a bit of a pain. It might be a bit of a challenge to go out there and measure and weigh your crocodiles. I don't know if you've got any volunteers in the class, but I don't want to do it. So we're going to look at our crocodile and just figure out whether it's saltwater or freshwater crocodile. And based on that, we're going to put in like the mean or median kind of full grown weight for these creatures. So, um, you know, the, the, the saltwater crocodiles, you know, it's less than twice as long as a freshwater crocodile, but you can see it's like five or six times heavier. I don't know if anyone here wants to wrestle with something 400 kilograms big, but probably not a good idea. Um, so this is like a convenience function. Or it's, it's a sort of a user-defined constructor. Um, it's defined externally or out, like to the struct. So you can define struct, uh, constructors inside this struct block here. They're called internal constructors. Or you can define them afterwards. I could put it in the next line of code or just somewhere else in my program. Um, and just take this crocodile object and use this syntax to attach a method to that pre-existing object um, like this. And it's called an ex external constructor. Um, yes. Does Julia explicitly tie in type 
and the function there together as a constructor, or is it just um, like more of a coincidence? Yeah, no. So um, the question was, you know, is it just a coincidence that there's this function crocodile and there's this type crocodile? So actually, they're one and the same. So well, I, was, I, I sort of rushed over this before, but like every function in Julia, if I go like function or, you know, f of f, let's say f equals one, right? So whenever you run f, it's one, right? What Julia has actually done is it's actually created a whole new type for f. And for every type, there's a method table attached to it. So I can go like methods of f. Um, and it has like that default constructor now. Um, oh, sorry, the def sorry, not the default constructor. <laughs> sorry, it has that method that I just defined, which is equal to one, right? And I can do, for example, um, sorry, I can run it, but I can also like look at kind of like after Julia's like compiled it a bit, what does it kind of look like? So um, it sort of looks like this. This is sort of like once I take all the syntax sugar away, it sort of looks like this, right? Um, I could have defined it, uh, I could define another one, which is like f of x equals x plus one, for example. Um, so, and then this type of f, so it's not that I attached a method to f, I actually matched, attached a method to the type of f. Um, and then I look at, look at that, and it has, there's two methods, and I can sort of run f of like 42, and it'll give me 43, right? Um, and I can see, look at the kind of, look at what Julia thinks that, oh, sorry, that's the type code. Um, this is the sort of the syntax that Julia kind of has, has gotten out of it. So it's sort of like, it's like, oh, let's create this temporary variable called percent one, which is X plus one and then return it. All right. So in this lowered form, it's sort of like spread out all the temporary variables and things. And then there's like this um, sort of typed code that it produces. Um, so that's like the one above, but it's gone through them all. And it's, um, it's done a few things. Firstly, it kind of knows. So here it was just X plus one, right? Now it's kind of figured out that X plus one is of type in 64. But also it's, it's sort of looked at the plus operator, which sort of defers to this built-in function. And it's sort of inlined it, which is like an optimization, right? And then you can sort of see Julia, this is a bit unplanned, but it's, it's really cool, so it's worth seeing. You can kind of look at the code that Julia spits out to a program called LLVM, which is like a compiler backend. It's used by Rust and it's used by uh, Zygmunt, it's used by a bunch of programming languages um, as their compiler backend. Um, and it takes sort of intermediate code and converts it to machine code on a bunch of computers or web assembly or other things that you might want to target. Um, and eventually once LLVM is done with it, it turns into this code. Well, it actually turns into a bunch of bytes, but like the, the Intel 64 or the AMD 64, um, assembly code is written here. And so like, this is not stuff you really need to know, but like, Basically, um, I think this must be adding to a certain type of register. I can't, yeah, the Q means quad, which has to do with the fact that it's 64 bits. Um, so it's four times what an original word size was on the Intel architecture, which so brought up why there's a Q. Um, yeah. And then there's like return keyword and stuff here going on. So that's kind of funny, uh, but you can also sort of look at like, I don't know what this will do. I haven't done this before, but here's like some machine code for calculating the sine function. And you can sort of see there's lots of it. Um, and this would be one of those like polynomial expansion kind of algorithms I mentioned last week for the sine function. Um, yeah. Cool. Yes. Ah. Thank you, Yoni. So Yoni's actually fixed this. The cat has gone away. Dead cat three times. Mm, sorry. Nitan, yes, that's right. Um, 
Is it possible to get kind of partially mutable structs? Some attributes can be changed and others can't. Yes, in Julia 1.8, I've added a const keyword to the mutable struct so that you can keep some of your um, struct fields const while other ones are mutable. So um, that's something I've heard people ask for many years in Julia, and so finally it's possible. So it's sort of nice to see things evolve um, like that. But yeah, it's a good question. So um, the one thing that can be nice when you have a, a data structure is you might have things like um, things in here which might be computed depending on other things in here. And so they sort of have to be sort of internally consistent, right? And so if you make a mutable struct, people can fiddle with them and ruin your consistency. Right? So it's sort of nice to be able to make certain fields immutable so that your users can't go around and screw around with your data structures. Yeah. It doesn't matter to you guys because you're end users, but if you're a library writer or something, it can be helpful. All right, so here before, like I said, we only had these two methods coming from the constructor. Thank you, Yoni, for fixing that. Um, and now we have three methods after we've defined that. So internally, Julia's attached a third method to the type of crocodile, to the crocodile type, sorry, um, like that. All right, um, blah, blah, blah. Here we can see using this constructor, um, creating a saltwater or freshwater crocodile. It's just executing this logic up here, okay? Uh, but if we try to create an ice water crocodile, it doesn't exist. Crocodiles don't like the polar regions. They, they, they like to be warm. Um, so we had this flex dog type, which was parametric. Um, so actually the, um, the flex dog constructor, uh, the flex dog actually comes with some default constructors as well because I didn't have to actually provide that T. So if you remember the, the definition, um, the, normal, the normal way to create a flex dog would be actually including that T and then constructing the things. But it's added some extra methods um, to the sort of parent, the abstract type flex dog without the T, unparameterized type. And what it does, it looks at these and grabs their types and jams that type in the flex dog, right? So, um, if we call it with int integers, then we get this type. If we call it with these things, if you remember that syntax with the F, that tells Julia it's it, like that's scientific notation, right? So it could be 2.3E0 for float 64s or F0s for float 32. So that's why that's float 32. Um, but yeah, the usual way of describing the concrete type would be actually provide that T. Right. Um, now there was a constraint that that type had to be real. So if we try and put a complex in there or a string or something other weird in there, it'll Julia will complain, right? It expects T less than a subtype of real, uh, but it got complex. Um, cool. So now we have this one, we can create these functions with methods on them. So this, this, the way Julia works with multiple dispatch is a way a lot of other object oriented works with something called polymorphism, where you have different types of similar things with methods on them. Um, and and in, in an object oriented language, the methods are attached to the data structures. And then so given like a, a data structure, which might be a type of animal, there would be a method for animal noise, for example. And that would be a polymorphic method. You could have some array of abstract animals um, and you could, they would all have an animal noise function attached to them in some kind of virtual method table or a V table. Um, and they would, um, um, they, that's the way an object generated work, language works. So here we can do polymorphism um, by creating functions sort of outside the data structures. So we create a new function animal noise with one method on this line. And then these two lines, take the existing animal noise function and apply two new methods to them. That's what's going on in this code, okay? So we've created a single function and it ends up with three methods. Um, the dogs say wolf, the humans say hello, and the animals say, actually, Yoni, what do, the, what do the crocodiles say? Can you make that noise? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yoni, Yoni's our crocodile whisperer up there making ch ch, -ch sounds. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. And we can create like an array of all, like, you know, a, a collection of all these different types of animals. Um, and and do things to them. So, uh, for example, we could create a collection of, you know, a, croc a freshwater crocodile, a human, a saltwater crocodile, and a dog. And then we could ask, and we're using this special dot syntax here, which which sort of broadcasts the function to every element. So for each animal, call animal noise on it, and keep the result and put it in a new array. And this is the the new array of things that come out: crocodile sound, human sound, crocodile sound, doggy sound. Okay, so we saw we had animal noise and we saw we had three kind of methods on it. Uh, but one thing you might notice something's missing here is we have dog, but we don't have flex dog. Okay, so if we threw flex dog at it, it would explode, it would die. Okay, so um, um, we could, for example, create use this union type now. So both dogs and flex dogs say wolf. Okay, so that's, that's, this is where how, knowing the abstract types, how to use abstract types like union is useful is, is in these kind of situations. Um, and so um, animal noise itself is sort of a generic function with each, each, lots of methods on it. And each method doesn't have to deal with just concrete types. Each method itself could deal with abstract types um, on the inside. And in that case, we could take our list of animals, add a flex dog and call animal noise on it. And we get another wolf at the end because we have dog and flex dog at the end. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so what Julia would do in the case that a method, that the types over here on a method are themselves an abstract type, not a concrete type, is for when you call it, Julie will actually figure out, okay, given the concrete types, first, which, which of the three, well, now four methods, there'll be four methods after this, which of the four methods applies? And then it will look at that code, get that code for that method, one of those four methods, it'll find the right one. It'll take the code and then it will specialize it for that input type. So it will know whether it's a dog or a flex dog, for example, and it will compile code knowing that it's a dog or a flex dog, and it'll compile that all the way down and we figure out the types, you know, it'll pass to LLVM, it'll make that native code, and, and hopefully that runs fast at the end of the day, okay? So that's, that's, that's the way Julia handles polymorphism or like dealing with, you know, types that are related and doing, creating sort of reusable code and extensible code and stuff like that. Um, and that's the way, the fact that it compiles that sort of down to machine code for every type is the thing that kind of makes it fast. All right. Um, so the, like I was sort of alluding to a few times through the lectures, um, it's the interesting thing about the way all these types work is that at any point users can create new types. So we can create new types of animal, for example, or even new abstract types of animals like fish and, and birds and um, invertebrates. Um, but um, when you do do that, you should try and like respect the existing interfaces for that type. So we have types like number and array and things built into Julia, right? And there's interfaces for those, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what we seem to have here is that all animals, if you're an animal, you should be able to, um, you should be able to, uh, a user should be able to like use the animal noise function on you, right? So if you, if you do introduce, say, a cat, um, you should probably, while you're at it, also obey the animal interface. And the animal interface says, oh, you can ask the noise of the animal what it makes. Okay. So um, if you're defining a new type of number or a new type of abstract array or something, there's interfaces to obey and you should sort of implement them. Um, so, so using the interfaces like this let, lets users build larger programs with generic logic that already exists. So someone else might have written a function which writes a story about an animal uh, and it uses this animal noise on the inside to create the story. And so 
um, I can come along and define this cat type and inject it into the story and, and the story string will come out with the correct meow in the middle of the story, okay? So um, that, that's what kind of makes you, everyone's code kind of extensible and stuff. So um, the beauty of generic code is like, it doesn't need to be rewritten. If you, for example, added a new field to a struct or something, you want a little bit more flexibility, you add a field and then you don't have to rewrite all this code. You can use the code other people have written before. It's already existing um, or code you've already written before. You don't have to rewrite it. You don't have to recom you know, change your methods. Um, what you should do is have a kind of interface on the type that everyone kind of understands to be the sort of functions you can call with it um, and use those in your code. And then when new types pop up, or whatever, your code will still run with the new types. And it's flexible in the other way. Not only can you add new types of animal or new types of abstract array or new types of number, um, you can think up new interfaces. Like you could add a new generic function for animal um, um, in your own code. Like, I don't know, like it's name or something, um, or a scientific name or something like this. Um, and you can add new interfaces to other things. So for example, there's a package in Julia that's built in called mini algebra. And what it does is extends arrays so that they're linear algebra objects. So in that, in linear algebra, it says that when you add two vectors, you add all the elements together. And when you multiply two matrices, it uses the matrix multiplication algorithm, right? So it's taking an existing array concept, which is a very fundamental computing subject, like topic um, concept, and it takes that and extends it or imbues it with like all these mathematical properties. And that, that's, that's kind of, I don't know, the essence of Julia, I suppose, is doing that kind of thing. Um, so I did speak a little bit about multiple dispatch. So let's look at this just one more time, just to make sure that this is really um, sort of bedded down in your head. Now, you're not gonna be creating complex type hierarchies and complex things, but you probably will have a function with like two methods or something in, pro in your projects. So I just wanna make sure you understand when you create those functions, when do they get called and things like that. So we're just going nice and slow. So we have this function, my f, and if it's an integer, it prints a string um, called my integer is x. Could someone tell me what does this function return? Does anyone know what this function returns? What's the return value of that function? Or type, return type? One answer. Oh, what answer? Nothing. Yes, Mitan, it's nothing, correct. So the print line function is a function which does something. It has a side effect. It, it prints to stand it out um, or whatever IO stream you want it to if you, if you specify the IO stream. Um, and, um, it, but it, it doesn't, create a value, it doesn't compute something for you to use somewhere else. It's just there to, to do things to the to the you know the output stream. So it returns nothing. And the second one also returns nothing, but it will print a different string. It says my floating point number is X. Okay. So here we go. We can go call my function of two. Um, and it's prints out my integer is two. Um, and just we've just got the show thing here just to sort of prove what I just said. Um, the, the actual return type of that function is nothing. Return value is nothing. But if we called it with two and a half, a floating point number, it says my floating point number is two and a half because it executes this logic, not that logic, All right? And we can see here are the methods of f. It says there's two methods for generic function called my f. The first method here, right? So this is the signature of the method. It takes an in64. Um, this is the module that it was defined in. And this is the file that it was defined in. And this is the line number on that file that it was defined in. Okay. Now, because this is weave, what it what it's really saying is it's line two of this code block, right? So it's, it's pointing to this line, which is like the first line of the function body. Um, and then we've got this second method and we can read that again. This is a method that takes float64. It's in the main module. It's in the same file. 
um, but it's on line six. So if that was line two, then we go three, four, five, six, that's line six, okay? So it's the first line that the body of the function appears, that's the line number. Um, now, if you wanna go, if you're interested in this stuff, if you like learning about how programming languages work, there's this really cool video by Stefan Kapinski. Uh, I won't, don't really want to show much of it, but you click on it um, and your browser doesn't like me anymore. Why doesn't my browser? Okay. So this is like a YouTube video. Um, and this guy's one of the creators of Julia. And he's just talking a little bit about uh, or cats and dogs, sort of like we were. Um, and um, it sort of explains how the dispatch works in Julia. So it's just kind of cool talk. It might be a bit advanced, but you know, if you like that kind of thing, you can, you can optionally just check it out if you want some fun. No pressure. Um, cool. So now, like I said, like functions have lots of methods and sometimes it could actually be a bit ambiguous which method you call because I did mention that the function methods might also take abstract types. So let's say, we create a new version of my f, which takes any kind of number, all right? And it says my number is x. So we, now we've got three methods, right? So just to look here, we've got the two we had before, and we've got a third one um, here. Now, if we call it my f with two, that matches this first one. And it also matches this last one because in integer, n64 is a type of number. But this one's more specific. This is a more specific type. So if if it has a sing, if it has zero methods that that could match, it throws an error. It says no method exists. Right? If it finds one method that could match, it accepts that. That's the one. If there are two methods, it looks for the types or it considers. In fact, it considers all the arguments as a tuple. And it says, is, you know, the first thing a subtype of the second thing? And if so, it's more specific. Or, and, and then it could ask the question, is the second thing a subtype of the first thing? And then it's more specific. If neither of those are true, then it might raise what's called an ambiguity error. So you might need to, there might be some intersection of these two abstract types where it could be either, and it, it can't really figure out which it should be. It has no real heuristic to go by. So there's a few heuristics to make the them less common. Um, but generally speaking, it's possible that there could be zero methods or there could be two or more methods that equally match your inputs. And in either case, Julia will complain, throw an error. If it, it, hopefully, and, and this is where you using like well-defined interfaces and things, there's you know patterns you can follow so that you don't fall into this trap. Um, that there will always be one method for it to choose the right method. Yeah. Okay, so are there any questions about specificity, like how how multiple dispatch chooses a method? Uh, so, like like just to go through the results here, if you call it with two, you still get my integer is two because that's more specific than the number one, right? But for something like a rational number, which we haven't done anything specific for it'll fall back to kind of like the default version, my number is, yeah. Yes, question, yes. Uh, you need to scroll up a bit. Yeah. Uh, so we have to find, so you won't make that function twice. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. theoretically we made it once, attached one method, and then we attached a second method. So could you do it in one go, just attach both methods? No, no, the syntax doesn't work that way, unfortunately. There's no, and there's no real syntax for create it. Oh, there, there, actually, there is actually a syntax for create a function with zero methods. So if you just go function my f end, so I'll, I'll just show it here. If I just do this, I can't remember if you need a semicolon or not. Yeah, there we go. So here's our credit function has zero methods, right? So it's possible to do that as well. And why would on earth would you want to do this? Well, Julia has this thing called doc string. So I could say, you know, documentation, you know, right? And then and then I can find help for that. So I could create an interface function for other people to fill in that I don't want to create any specific methods for and document it here. And then people creating concrete types later on the line, they can add methods to it that I don't care about. 
Um, and, but they don't have to write docs because they can, that method's meant to do a certain, that function's meant to do something and I can document it once for everyone. And you'll find library code and stuff works like this a bit. <laughs> oh, beautiful. We'll do this in Unisix, yeah. But that's something you can do. So, um, but yeah, implicitly, obviously, the first time you do this, it creates the function and the type of the function in the background. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Can you define multiple methods at once? Now, what you could do is you could use union in float 64, and then inside the body said, if X is an int 64, do this, and if X was float 64, do that. Um, that could theoretically be slower because it might need to check at runtime, or the compiler might figure out runtime with constant propagation and things like that, and tricks like this. Um, you don't know, but uh, I like the way that you write them separately because I feel it, it like, lets me think about different concerns at different points in time. Um, but I don't know if that's just, it just works well with my brain or whether that's generally a good idea. Uh, are there any more questions with the dispatch and the function methods? Just spending time on this because it's kind of the core cool bit that will help you, I think, with your projects and so on. You know, apart from the actual problems you're solving, which are interesting math problems in their own right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is what we, we can do in Julia is we can, um, for example, um, think about existing functions like the plus function in Julia. So remember this plus is just syntax sugar for calling the plus function. So that, so I know I've said this before, but two plus three and um, plus, sorry, two, three are exactly the same thing. Okay. So we can, we can look at the, we can use this which macro, it'll tell us which line of code it's on. So we could actually go here, we could, we, it would open up, you know, some function in, in the standard library of Julia. Um, we could pipe those method that, that methods is sort of basically, it's basically an array of functional methods essentially. And so we could like find the length of that. And there's 298 methods defined in plus. So it's a popular, a popular thing, right? So obviously I don't want to like show you them all, but like you can add matrices and you have know, voted point numbers and you can add rational numbers and you can add so many different things in Julia. Um, you know, you can multiply strings to concatenate them. Like there's very, there's lots of things that are overloaded. Um, so let, let's try and make that 299, okay? Cause that'll be fun. Um, so imagine we had a computer game and the players could have a score. So you have the name of the player and their score. Um, and Johnny has 22 points, right? Um, so I'm Johnny, apparently. Uh, me is Johnny. Um, and let's say me gets 10 more points. So how do we, can we, can we try and do something like that? Um, and I'll say, oh, actually, I looked at every one of those 298 methods. Um, it was exhausting and I didn't find any that matched. Okay, so this is a, this is what I was saying before method error. So there's zero methods that match. Okay, well let's import the plus function and start defining things on it. So you, here you could import it, which means we're allowed to extend it. That's what the import keyword kind of means. Or I could have just put base dot plus there. Now because plus isn't a normal variable, you, it's you got to sort of quote it with those dots and things. It's a bit funny. So it's sometimes a bit. Um, nicer just to import it beforehand. It makes your code a bit shorter as well. So here we're defining a new method on plus, the plus from base, um, where we play a score is on the left and some integer is on the right. And this returns a new player score with the same player name, but the score has been incremented by n. Okay. So just to be clear, this thing's constructing a whole new object. The player name, the player score was immutable. So we could have made this immutable struct and just edited this field in place. We're doing something different. We're creating an immutable struct and the plus function will construct a new instance of that. It's much more of a pure functional programming kind of approach. Yes. Yeah, so that um, it's not automatically commutative to be clear. So with numbers, it has some nice things where it will 
kind of promote the numbers so that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same type. And then you don't have to define all these different plus members for all the different combinations. Otherwise, it wouldn't be 298 versions. It would be like 30,000 versions or something, you know, methods. <laughs> um, but when you, like, this isn't a type of number and that won't happen automatically. So um, what we've got here is we, if we really wanted to do this properly, we'd probably want to put, put it with the other way around as well, maybe. Or maybe we'd leave it like that because we're happy with it like that. But Julia doesn't sort of inherently know that plus should be commutative, right? Like generally you would implement plus to be commutative just to be nice to the people using plus because they might assume it. But you don't have to, right? There's no rule. There's no guarantee. Um, but here we've added 10 more points to Johnny's 22 and Johnny now is 32 points, right? Um, we can another good one to overload is show so we can import show from base show um takes an io stream and like throws strings at it essentially so you print strings into it um so we could say if we wanted to show a player name we could say the score for the player name is score right um okay and then print line we have some we have a school we have a sum score. Oh my god! I don't know why it says that. We have a score for, uh, for me. Pretty good. We have some score. Score for Johnny equals thirty-two. Pretty good. So this dollars thing is actually turning the object into a string for you. Okay, it's interpolating it into the. It's sort of splicing, turning me into a string, and then splicing it in the middle of that string. Um, and you get to define this logic. So like at the REPL. If you create one of these things, that's sort of what will get printed out now. It won't look like that. It it will it, instead of looking like that, it would look like this bit here, just that bit there. All right. So we've sort of changed the way things are shown, and that's how like you look. You print arrays and different things are truly, and they come out all pretty. We can control all that. So we're going to do a little bit more complicated example um, here, uh, and and. I think then we'll take a break. So this is sort of a fun one. We're actually going to do something useful with all this finally. We're not going to talk about cats and dogs. This is actually uh, an important bit of statistics that people need to use. Um, there's this whole field called online statistics. Um, and so imagine you're a big company like Google or Meta or Facebook or, or whatever, and you've got lots of data coming in and it's coming from all over the internet everywhere. Right, and some of it you can record on your servers, on you know your data centers with the hard drives, and sometimes you just want to aggregate things like how many people did log in today, and things like that. And rather than like store terabytes of data about every login, you could like throw login events to to this thing that creates summary statistics, which statistics might be like how many people logged in, like how many people per hour, what was the variation, like what was the standard deviation, and you know, minimum and maximum people that logged in in a given minute and things like that. So you get statistics about this kind of thing. And then you might create a dashboard and plot like the median and the, you know, the different quartiles or whatever of the number of people that logged in each minute. And then if you can sort of see that it's sort of going along, going along, and then it goes down like this, then you've probably had some kind of like outage in those few minutes. You get to see this sort of stuff. So it's, it's very common in production situations. It could be oil and gas. It could be any, any industry. Um, that where you have sort of sensors and data and you want to create some kind of statistics and do monitoring and do dashboarding and do different things like that, okay? So online statistics um, are statistics where, you know, you, it's talking about these internet scale problems where you don't necessarily want to store all the data and like scan over the data every time you want to answer a question. What you're going to do, it's more like one of those Unix pipe programs that Paul, Paul will introduce. So it's like, you, what you're going to do is you're going to put a little bit of data in it um, and it's going to create, it's going to track some statistics for you and then it's going to forget about the data. And then you give it a bit more data, it'll, it'll update the statistics and then forget what you gave it. And then you give it a bit more data, it'll update its statistics and then forget what you gave it, right? So let's try and do this without that optimization, without that extra trick of forgetting what you know. Imagine we had some online statistics and we had this function fetch new data. So this, this is sort of the, the core thing. This data is going to come from somewhere in the outside world, probably. Like if it's an online statistic, it's 
you know, events from people on the internet, for example, they're coming to you. Um, but we're going to sort of simulate this as it's, it's, it's an unlimited stream of like random numbers between zero and a hundred. Um, this, this produces a random number between zero and one. Okay. So this is random numbers between zero and a hundred. Um, you know, the mean of that will be 50, um, and so on, you know, the minimum will be zero, the maximum will be a hundred. Um, so, and we've got this function that we're going to call, which will simulate this idea of just getting, getting the data from the input stream, right? So get, get the next batch of data, get the next batch of data. And we're going to call it over and over and over, get me more data, get me more data. And then we're going to want some statistics on it. So let's imagine we don't want this to run forever. We want to run it N times, maybe a thousand times or something, hundred times, but maybe, maybe in, in a production situation, you know, it could be billions of times, right? Um, and we have something to store some temporary data in, right? So I haven't put any, I haven't put these symbols here, right? This is any, this could be anything, right? And we're going to, we're going to look in this function and it'll tell us what this thing needs to be able to do. So we're going to get some data. We're going to get a data point. We're going to fetch new data and get one data point. And we're going to push this into the connect collection. Okay. So we have this storage. So imagine for the moment, the storage is just starts as an empty array. Okay. Then we're going to put the data in the empty array. And the next time comes, we're going to put another data point in the empty array. And the third one comes, we're going to put another one in the empty array. And it's going to have like three things in it then. So this is an online statistics. This is actually just exact, remember everything statistics for the moment. So every time we get some data, we push it into this array, this data point into the storage. Um, and every 20th data point, we're going to print something out to you guys so you can see it. And we're going to print three statistics. One is the count. How many, how many things have we gotten so far? One is the mean. How many, how many, what's the mean? And the other is the max, right? We could do median, um, mean, minimum, like different statistics here. Now, some online statistics will be approximate. It's a really interesting field, but we're not going to deal with that. We're just going to deal with mean and max, which are things you can track efficiently without approximation. Okay, so we're gonna initialize our random seed, create an empty vector for storage, and we're gonna call this thing, okay? So what's gonna happen is this empty vector is gonna go in here, there, and this is gonna be 100. And we're gonna loop around 100 times. Every time in the loop, we add something to the vector, the array, and then every 20th time we calculate and spit out these statistics, all right? And so what we get here is after 20, we got the mean of 43. Hang on. Why is the mean 43? Why isn't it 50? It's a random number between zero and 100. So what's happened? Yeah, we're given a small number of random numbers. Okay. So it's a small sample. There's only 20 things in the sample. So it's just like rolling the dice. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. In this case, we've got sort of a below average total, I suppose. Um, we've never seen any number bigger than 90.47 um, and so on. But what happens as we, as the count increases, the, the mean slowly drifts and it's sort of a random walk. It's a drunken walk. It's like a Brownian motion kind of walk towards the true median mean, sorry, um, as, as the count increases, okay? And as we do more, we're more likely to see cl things close to the extremes, maximums near 100 and minimums near zero. Okay. Now imagine the scenario where we want to do this in a very big thing, so billions of times. Okay. We don't want to really necessarily want to push these things into this array because we'll run out of RAM. And don't forget, if we want to calculate the mean or something um, of an array, we have to add up all the things in the array and then divide, right? So we've got this loop, we might want to do it a billion times. Inside the loop, we have to do this thing which involves a billion operations. It's just going to be too slow and it's going to take up too much RAM. We can't do it that way. So we're going to create a little structure for cal calculating our running stats with, the, with the, the count, the sum, and the max, okay? So this is going to be a little data structure we have. It's mutable. Um, we can update how many things we've come across. We can add things to the sum and we can update the maximum value we've seen. And that's what we're going to do. So by default, here, here we have an inner constructor. So we've overridden all those other constructors. They're not, they don't exist in this case. Um, there's a single constructor here to create one. 
with a count of zero, a sum of zero, and a maximum minus infinity. Now, minus if this is a trick, this is just a, a really neat trick that we often use, um, is that you want to kind of um, use the, the smallest number possible so that when you get an actual number and compare them, the new number you got will become the new maximum, right? So let's say I, I put a, a, a max of zero here and the, next, the first number I got was minus one, then zero would stay the maximum, which is incorrect. So I've seen one sample, it was minus one. I, I want to be able to say that, okay, the thing that we, and, and we'll see the algorithm down here and we push it. So when we do find, add the new statistics to this collection, we, we run through this thing, okay? And we update the count by adding one. We update the sum by adding the data point. And we do this thing. If the, if, the, um, if the max is smaller than the data point, we update the max to the data point. So minus infinity is smaller than everything. So the first data point will always have an effect. Will always, that will always happen on the first data point. Does that make sense? So that's that trick with the minus infinity here. Um, once we have some statistics, we can use the length function to, to grab the count. The sum function, well, we've already been computing the sum. We can have the mean, which is the sum divided by the count. And we can have the maximum, which is just the max thing that we've been tracking all along, okay? All right, and we can run this again. So notice what we're going to do, we're going to create, to redo the random seed, so we're getting the same numbers. And we're going to create this storage and we're going to call this function. Now, I haven't updated that code. I haven't changed this code. It's still running this code. Remember, this code wanted one of these, which lets you push, it lets you do length, it lets you do mean, and it lets you do maximum. So this is where we're talking about interfaces and things. So long as we obey all the interfaces this generic code expects, we can put it in here, and that's perfectly okay. All right, and so here is our much more efficient online stats, and they're coming up with the same numbers as before. You know, 43 was here. We saw that earlier. 98, we saw that earlier, right? So it's exa doing exactly the same, giving exactly the same answers before, but more efficiently. And the person who wrote this code might not even know about it, right? Like they could be two different people on two different teams or two different organizations. And we've just injected this thing here and it's worked out okay. All right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, sometimes you might have other kinds of numbers you want to take maxims and means of, like float 32 or decimal numbers or whatever. So we can make this a bit more flexible um, by having a type parameter here. So we can, um, actually, this should be deleted. That was my mistake. An old version of this code had that there. Just pretend that line doesn't exist um, and pretend that line doesn't exist. Sorry about that. Um, so here the count and the sum and the max, they actually involve the type T. Um, and we could run it again with, for example, integers this time. In which case, I think it's rounding, probably rounding the number before each time. But yeah. Oh, no, hang on. We've updated this to return an inch between 0 and 10,000 um, and then run it again. So this is, again, this is where those type parameters come in handy. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's really nice that we can do this sort of generic code. Um, I'll just take an extra minute to finish this before we have a break. Um, so there is a problem here with this. So what would happen here if T was complex? Can anyone see a problem with T being complex? What would happen? Yes, at the back. Yes. So complex numbers don't have an order. You can't really say that, you know, um, is, is one plus I bigger or smaller than two, right? Or whatever. Like you could define some order, but it's not really naturally, like mathematicians don't normally consider it an ordered field. Um, uh so um that's just an interesting thing so you know 
the person who wrote this very flexible thing, you know, they might want to go back and change this to real. Sort of. So this is again interfaces. I can write this this function with the assumption that t is number, and then I can say, okay, that's not actually true because this doesn't work on number. That works on real, but doesn't work on number. Okay. So if we replace that with real, I can look at this code and just validate in my head. Okay, every line of this code should work for a real number. So therefore, it's not going to crash at runtime, or you know, when it, when you try and use it. Um, so yeah, so it's really good to consider kind of the interfaces of your inputs and, and like the things inside your structs to sort of tell you what you're allowed to do and what's appropriate. And some programming languages like Rust um, or Haskell, they're really wordy. They'll make you like specify to the umpteenth degree these interfaces as sort of contracts that you can never validate. Julia takes the approach of it's a strongly typed language, but it's a bit more dynamic of feeling. You can kind of do duck typing. Go as a language with the same kind of um, design principles that it, you, you create these kind of interfaces as on an ad hoc basis um, and you use consume them on an ad hoc basis and that way people can put together their code um, easily. Um, cool. We'll talk a little bit about um, some example interfaces in Julia and nested data before handing over to Yoni, but let's have a eight minute break and get back at 6, 10 p.m. Thanks. Yes, Max, that's right, Matan. Yeah. Cool.
that makes more sense. And at least like there's some way of like yeah, yeah. jiggling it. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm not looking at them. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Arguably, if you know everything I've gone through, it's more like intimate with your son. I'm probably a bit different. I'm showing you everything. You can see you're getting your head around it. And, and because you guys are all smart and, and you know, all of it, you know, so you can get it. You know, sometimes you might want to think and sort of understand, you know, what are the axioms? You know, we're using real numbers, you know, they're the axioms. We want to learn um, it. Just mix up the you are involved in the matrix structure of the right? like in the way matrices are defined yeah right? between what is 0 0.6 0 0.7 I don't know. so there was like a change yeah, the four, right. 0 0.5 there's a four or five yeah. so you 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 opened a lot of the issues and uh, oh, they were, so they had the problem of not really having seen the um so um, so if you had like uh, I don't know, I don't know. Is that right? So we got we got like this transpose thing now with this adjoint type, right. and you can have like a vector like one two uh, like that. All right, and you can do obviously m times v. And you know, in terms of essentially, right? that always worked. Mm -hmm. But the bit that didn't, the bit that didn't work was this one. So, and so, what not we used to work. What did yeah, there we go. So identities like that they don't used to work. So, so this is where we have the transfer, this adjoint, this adjoint thing. So that's the new thing, All right? And there's um, transverse as well. So that you know, which is obviously without the um, complex conjugation. Oh, yeah, so previously that would just so the, previously those two functions, adjoint and transpose, just used to create a one by n array rather than remember that they're actually the jewel of a vector. So now they remember they're a jewel of a vector. And so when you multiply them, it looks out. And then you get things like um, this uh, and this one. Um, these used to return arrays instead of uh, numbers. Arrays of scales. Yeah, like a one D thing. Yeah. yeah, so that's... Yeah, yeah the, and that, there are other. There's a series of things that I did. Yeah, <laughs> they mentioned them very generously. So, that's nice. yeah, yeah. But that was the fun one. That was a ridiculous issue. Like, you go to the GitHub issue, and it's like no, I remember it, yeah. three kilometers of. If you printed it out, it'd be like three kilometers of paper. You know. <laughs> Uh, if you have like uh, 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 okay. Hi, Matan. I, I was hoping to get to that after Yoni talks. So while he's doing his thing, I might look for that on my laptop. Um, and if there's time at the end of the class, I'll speak to it. Um, if we do run out of time, I think I'll just put it on backboard or something. Okay. Okay. Well, let's 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 just smash through the rest of it and give Yoni a bit of time. Um, so yeah, uh, so we we sort of saw a little bit of how we can like create a type and inject it into places to do two things. Maybe even the original writer of the code didn't expect, um, and we do this through like just obeying the interface as expected by that thing. So there's this idea of duck typing. 
And I think this is pointing the wrong place, is it? And there's this idea called duck typing. Um, and if it, it, it goes like this, if it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck, okay? So, um, you know, if um, we'll, we'll talk about the kind of things, but like in, the case, in that case, if it could walk and quack like a push, something that can push and do length and sum and maximum and mean, um, then that function we wrote earlier can, can accept it and use it, okay? Just as so long as it does those things. Um, so let's just have a look at an example of some interfaces. So numbers, for example, we come across numbers a lot. So there's common things like plus, minus, times, divide, and things in numbers, min, max, this sort of stuff, right? Um, well, even then, we saw min and max don't work for complex numbers, right? So that's only defined on reals. Um, we have something called promotion. So if you take too many numbers of any two different types, um, then um, oh, sorry, that shouldn't say promote type, that should just be promote. And then call promote on them, you'll get two numbers back. So let, let, let's just have a look at this at the REPL. So if, if, I, if, I, if I do that, we get this. And if I do this, um, sorry, let's, let's do that and make it a bit clearer. Um, so because the second number was a floating point number, what we do, and we can't convert that into an integer, we actually do it the other way around and we convert the integer into floating point number. And then they're both the same. So when you call promote, you always get two of the same thing out. And then you can add them and stuff pretty trivially. You don't have to worry about adding integers to floating points. You just define a, pro a promotion rule to, to sort of pre-process it. And that runs through a function called promote rule, um, which has a bunch of methods, 124 of them. Um, and uh, you can kind of sort of see the kinds of things people define, but it's going to be too much. There's a lot of a lot of rules here, but you can do things like promote rule. I think like float sixty four an integer, um, and you get float sixty four back from that, right? Um, and that's basically, you know, abstract floats have some things Paul showed you about significance and stuff like that. Antisses. Um iterables. So when we use a for loop in Julia, that's, that requires use, implementing the iterable interface. So that includes iterate. So that's the syntax sugar that a for loop is, calls this iterate function. You can overload it yourself. Um, iterables tend to have a length and an element type. So when you iterate it, how many times will it iterate? And L type is like, what will come out of the iterate? Like will come out of strings or numbers or what will come out? Of um, now, some things that you can put in a for loop, could, they could be like streams of unknown size. So you don't know the actual size beforehand. They could be infinite. They could be, um, you could define a type that always iterates and just returns 42 every time, 42, 42. Or it could return one, two, three, four, five. And it could be unbounded length. And so there's a trait function, iterator size, that can tell you whether the size is known in advance. If the size is known, then it's safe to call length, right? Um, if this if isn't known, and you call length, it will actually try and iterate it to, call, to compute the length, right? Which could be dangerous because you might, you might consume a stream or something and it might be sort of irreversible. Um, and then the L type, the other thing is like, you might, there might be some weird computation that's producing a scheme. You actually don't know what, what's going to come. I can't, I can't answer this question either, right? So there's some traits there. Um, arrays, arrays are iterable. Right, they have a length. Um, they have a L type. We know the L type of array. Right, that's that's the type parameter T, um, and they can iterate. You put them in a for loop, right? But you can also index them. So you can. There's this function called get index, uh, which is um, what this what this syntax calls, right? And then there's set index, which which takes an index and puts a value in that slot. Okay, and that's the function behind this kind of syntax. Um, and there's size, so arrays can be multi-dimensional. So this gives you all the different sizes of the different um, axes. So like a, a two by three matrix would have size, which would be a tuple two comma three. Okay, the size of a vector is still a tuple, but with one thing in it. Whereas the length of a vector would just be the number three. It wouldn't be a tuple, it'd just be three. The size is a tuple with three inside. Um, 
In fact, if we wanted to, we could create our own array in Julia with just these methods. So it's sort of distilled down to the point now that you can, you can in like a couple minutes, create a custom array type for Julia to use. And all the nice things and the linear algebra and everything will just work with it, okay? Because you implement the index. Um, things like ranges, for example, are types of arrays in Julia. So if you go like one to 10, and you can go like, you know, type of that, you know, and then we can ask the super type of that, and then you can just use ants here. That's an abstract unit range in 64, which is a type of ordinal range, which is a type of abstract range, which is a type of abstract vector. Okay. So, and an abstract vector is a type of abstract array, right? So, um, even these things are just arrays. They're not mutable. They don't implement this one, but they implement these two, size and get index. And so they can broadcast with arrays into all those sorts of beautiful things. Um, and like I said, just using kind of interfaces like this one and this one, um, they implemented the linear algebra library, which lets you multiply matrices and all those fun things. Find eigenvalues of matrices, singular value decompositions, invert matrices, you know, solve linear problems, that kind of thing. Um, and all, all you need for that is basically these two functions, right? And that, so, so long as your inputs provide that, then you can do all those algorithms. Sets, sets are another thing we often use in Julia. So they support an in function. So you can ask, is something in the set? So these are like mathematical sets. Like you might have a set of strings, string A, string B, and string C. And you could ask, is string B in the set? And it, it will say true or false. Right. Um, internally, it's using a hash map so that lookup is very fast. So it's like one of those order n, order one, order log n kind of things. And you know, there's things like you can do set unions and set intersections and things with sets, and that's all coming coming with Julia, right? Um, and then there's dictionaries. Um, dictionaries have two sort of types associated with them: a key type and a value type. So a dictionary is a mapping from a key to a value. Um, they're a bit like arrays, um, you know, and sets, you know, they're, 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 they're iterable, but they're a bit like arrays in that you can also use the indexing operations on them with the key. So, um, you can get index and set index with them with keys. Uh, but you, you also got has key. It does that key exist in the dictionary, which is a bit like in on the set, right? So if you go keys of the dictionary, you get a set of the keys by which I mean it's actually an abstract set, like it actually obeys that set interface. Um, and has key is sort of equivalent to the key is in the keys of it. Um, so set index in a dictionary in Julia will either update a key if it exists or insert it if it doesn't exist. So it's sometimes called an upsert operation, update or insert. Um, we can delete a key um, and you can ask, there's two, there's these trait functions here. Right? You can ask what's the type of the keys and what's the type of the values because, because when you iterate it, by default, you iterate pairs from, um, of things in the dictionary. Um, but you could ask to iterate just the keys or just the values so in the for loop. So let's have a look at that. So D equals like dict, um, you know, and you can do things like you can map one to A. Two, B, three, C, and it's sort of it's sort of figured out that the key type is in sixty four and the value type is string, right? Um, it contains these pairs. They're in a weird order. Notice it's not one two three; it's two three one. That's because they've been hashed up and sort of put in random places. But it means you can look them up quickly. Um, so I can go like D of two and it'll give me B, right? And I can ask, um, you know, has key D, D four, and it'll say false, right? Um, and I could, but I could put it in like that and then, then it's there as well. So they're dictionaries, they're really useful. Um, yeah, so these are the kind of interfaces you have in Julia. And basically I've shown you everything 
you know, like well, <laughs> up to almost advanced Julia, right? Like you, you, I've shown you lots of things, but it's basically anything you might want to know. Um, one last thing before I hand out of the Yoni. There's this really nice thing you can do to create interesting data structures. So we've seen arrays, an array is an interesting data structure. Um, and like the hash maps here, they're based on array techniques. But sometimes you want to use tree techniques when you want to create trees and graphs of objects. Okay, and you can do this in memory using pointers. Um, so imagine you had a tree and the tree consisted of nodes. So you have like a node at the top and it has children nodes and each child might have more children nodes and each of those children might have more children nodes and they, each node could have an arbitrary number of children. Okay, so if we take a node, it might have like an ID of the node um, and it would have a bunch of children or friends, things it's associated with. So maybe in this case, actually, it's not a tree, it's not a directed graph, it could be like a, a it's not an acyclic graph necessarily. It's more like a, a friend network, like on Facebook or something. Um, um, yeah, and so you could have an arbitrary number of friends on Facebook, right? It could be zero, it could be 100. Um, so, so you have a, a vector of, of nodes, which are your friends. Um, when, and the way something like Facebook will work, when you, when you join, it will make a random sort of identifier for you. Um, and use that as sort of a key for you for identifying you internally in its systems. Um, that way you can like update your email address or your name or whatever. It doesn't have to get, it doesn't have to mess up this graph of nodes, right? That's what the ID thing's about. Um, and um, you can obviously create, put children in nodes. You can push them into this, this node thing and you could like ask questions about the graph of nodes, like which nodes are related to which and like are they clusters, are they disjoint graphs and different things, right? And so you can create all sorts of interesting mathematical structures um, this way where we've actually got a struct called node that's sort of referring to itself in the definition, okay? Now, when you're doing this, obviously, um, Julia needs to know um, that this relationship would potentially be circular. So it will have to, it will pick that up and realize that the struct must be identifiable by a pointer so that you can create these cycles. Um, that's all I want to talk about. We're going to have some words from Yoni about project one and so on. Um, yeah. I think you meant to say that maybe there were some questions. Yeah, oh yeah, questions. Yes. So under this, could you do that? On this one, you could. You could. You could. Um, you know, once you've created yourself, you could then later put yourself into the into this vector. So yeah, it could be like a self-referential kind of thing. That's correct. Yeah. In fact, because this is a vector, not a set, for example, you could actually be friends with someone twice and things like that. But if you wanted to make it one, only one, then you could make that set instead of vector. And the set will make sure there's only one of each element. Beautiful. We'll, we'll, we'll get another chance to thank Andy, but since he's an industry guy, busy working all day, maybe we thank him twice this semester. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Yanni. Um, so we'll see you in unit six and seven. So yeah, I'll be coming back um, end of October, I think. Is it? Right. So, yeah. yeah, on simulation, which is actually very much related to your current day project. Yeah, simulation. Yeah. yeah. So, what we've got is we've got the unit with Paul Vervik um, and some lectures with Yoni and, and uh, Matha and so on. Uh, and then after the study break, um, I'll come back with simulations. And then data as well. Uh, uh, and sorry, summer. and data like, like yeah. table, tabular data, data frames, these mm -hmm. kind of concepts. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. I think I'll you want, steal um, your share screen. Let's see. Yeah. Stop I can just do that. Oh, yeah, that should be. Okay. All right. So, um, welcome to unit five. And what what I'm going to do here is is uh, I'm going to be the uh, the warm up guy for uh, Paul Verbeek. 
Um, let's see, reclaim all right so in unit five uh it's all about project one uh, which which is a big deal this project because um because it's 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 a major uh endeavor that involves kind of multiple um files and um it's it's just a bit complex. So so for some of you, this might be the first time where you've actually dealt with something that involves um, multiple files spanning. Um, you know, there's a, there are a few types we define, and these things need to play together. Now the good news is that you already have the source code for Project One, so you just need to improve it. Um, and most of you would have probably already seen Practical E. If you haven't, that's a practical where I filled in last week. Um, so if you haven't, please please do so. And what I want to do today is is overview actually some of the code structure inside the project. Um, but I also just want to direct you to the mathematical background which you need. So the fact is that you actually don't need so much mathematical background um, because a good part of Project One is is actually. I mean, you're mathematicians, you know what polynomials are, but um, maybe you don't know the Chinese remainder theorem or for Mao's little theorem, but they will pop up towards the end, okay? And, and you'll, you'll be dealing with uh, implementing an algorithm or two that involve these things, okay? Um, but still just, so, so I'll, 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 speak, I'll speak about the mathematics for a few minutes um, or just more direct you to, to where these things are. And then we'll really deal with the code and run a few things. And of course, feel free to ask some questions and discuss, et cetera. So what you can do is take a look at this sequence of YouTube videos. And obviously your time is tight. So you might not, not look at all of them, but look at, at perhaps the second one which discusses rings. So if you don't know what rings are, okay. And look at the fourth one, which discusses elementary number theory, namely the greatest common divisor and Euclid's algorithm and uh, division okay, and the Chinese remainder theorem. Uh, but again, Paul Verbeek will actually outline this as part of, as part of unit five. Okay, so but you can so if you what you could spend this time is just maybe listening to the second lecture and the fourth lecture here, um, maybe just to get a feel for it. This is you're not you're not examined on this or anything like that. But there'll be terminology uh, that is needed. Okay, whereas if you actually have just a bit more time, then just go through all five lectures and then you'll go with the groups, rings, fields, elementary number theorem, and then for Mas Little theorem, and that's kind of the elements that we need to to get project one going. However, your key to success is probably the code and probably uh, the design of the code and understanding what's going on. And let's look at that. And by the way, so project one up to today, up to a couple of hours ago, if I go here to project one, then there's a link to this GitHub repo. Up to a couple of hours ago, um, Somebody sent me an email. I think I forgot to reply to that one, or maybe I did. There was a warning that said, do not mirror this repo yet. Okay. Uh, it was you? <laughs> no. But at this point, at this point, the repo is stable. So go ahead and copy the repo, mirror the repo, make a copy of this repo, make it your own, right? And we're not going to make any more changes to this repo. It's not perfect. It's not perfect code. And that kind of simulates a situation which you will have also uh, in any other project where you're coming in industry into some setting or in a research project into some setting. There's something that sort of works, but you want to make it better. Okay. So the practical E covered last week. You got the recording for that on Blackboard. Shows you how to mirror the repo, et cetera. But now let's, let's just run a few things. Okay. So basically when I'm here, I can run... Um, just close all of these for a second. I can run three types of things. So first of all, I can just go, and this is the main file, which runs this project, okay? This is not a package in the Julia sense. When you meet Andy again, uh, you might hear more about package development and packaging things with modules. 
and even maybe potentially uploading it to the Julia Packard repository. But this is some file and it's called polynomial polyfactorization project, which includes all these other files. Okay. So all the files included are in the SRC, the source folder. Okay. So that's, that's a common uh, repository structure. And there are also files in the test folder, but we'll look at these in a second. Okay, and the source for folder has subfolders. So we just indented this so we can see what the subfolders are like. So if I run this, what this is doing is actually doing a few of those import based commands. So there's actually a lot of the things that Andy just taught you. Uh, we're actually gonna overload the plus operator, the minus operator and a few others. Okay, and all these lines of code ran. Now at this point, nothing happened. Okay, because well, my repo just has all this code and actually there's nothing here even, it doesn't even print the last thing, okay? But I can do something like x equals x poly, for example. So x poly is a function in the system now. Oh, sorry. Nicer like that, that. And here is even its doc string. So we gave some doc strings here and you will also write your own doc strings. Construct a polynomial of the form x, okay? So I can do x equals x poly. I could have also done y equals x poly. And now let's see what this thing is. So x is a polynomial. And this is a type which the system just defined and you can work with this type. Well, what can you do with a polynomial? Maybe you can add two polynomials and now you've got one x to the power one plus one x to the power one is two x to the power one. Or maybe you can add a polynomial and a hundred times a polynomial to the third power. And you've got now, so the type of the ants is a new polynomial. Okay. So this is the little very toyish computer algebra system. Tomorrow, Paul Verbeek will speak all about the philosophy of computer algebra systems. He worked in Maple. Okay, and uh, there's of course Mathematica, which you probably know, and there's also SymPy, and there's other, all kinds of computer algebra systems. This is one where we constructed it from first principles and you'll help make it better. Okay, that's kind of the general idea. Um, and you, could, you can do things such as, look, I can do, for example, let's go uh, up here and do, um, oh, I see, there's something happening here. That's funny. Um, so I'll do P equals X squared plus X, and I can do derivative of P. And look, the derivative of this polynomial, one to the power X to the power one plus one X to the power squared is one X to the power zero, X to the power zero is one plus two X. So we even do derivatives. Okay, now you might look at this and you say, hey, this is not printed nicely. Well, don't worry, that's your first task. You might've already read it, is to improve this pretty printing and make it a bit nicer. I mean, why have X to the power zero, right? It would have been just nice to have that. And maybe let's write it in a nice mathematical form where we write polynomials with the highest, you know, we go left to right with the highest uh, term on the left, right? So you can change that. So we'll see soon where that is in the code. But first of all, all I wanna say is if you are a user of this and you just run this, you can then use this, this system, okay? So that's one way in which you can run it. Now, the second way, um, let's close this, is you actually have an example script, okay? And you are required in one of the first tasks to improve this example script, okay? So let's go through this example script line by line. Um, so what we're doing here, by the way, we're just activating the current environment uh, in the current directory. And that means that the few uh, packages that we use are specified in project.toml and they're kind of included. Okay, so here I'm running this line and that does the same thing that we did before is actually running polyfactorization project. And here these lines are just putting P1 and P2. So I've got now P1 in the system and I've got P2. Good. And one nice thing that we can do already is multiply polynomials. So we can do P1 times P2. Okay. And well, I can't really see immediately if this is right, but at least let's look at the leading power. So the leading power of P1 is X cubed. P2 is X to the power of four. So two X cubed times X to the power of four is X to the power of seven and two times two is four. So this at least seems required. Okay. 
All right. And you can do more things here. We'll get to that soon. All right. But this is your example script. So you're also supposed to create a nicer example script and it will also showcase, and you'll do several example scripts, you'll showcase the functionality that you will be adding to this repository. Okay, so this is number two. That was the second way of running this thing. And when you left them, everybody misses their laptop. You gotta, after 10 minutes, you need a laptop. <laughs> Okay. Oops, sorry. All right. Now, the third thing you can do is you can go to the test folder. Now, you've started with test driven development from question one, or maybe it was question two of big homework, right? There was that test for checking the quadratic, right? And this is, this is just the way to roll. If you write something, write the test in parallel. Okay. Back when I worked in software, that was between 2001, 2005. And, you know, we used to, it was in C, it was all, it took a lot of time. And there was this mindset that, you know, every line of code that you write is, is holy. But, but after a year or two, it was kind of clear that for every line of operational code that we write, there was, there was about two or three lines of code. So about, you know, twice or three times as much of supporting code that does the testing. So I kind of, I was right in this transition uh, that was in embedded systems and things that run in microchips. Okay, so here we have a whole bunch of test code, which actually just tests that everything in this repo runs. And to tell you the truth, what uh, I did with this repo in the past couple of days is I took last year's project one, I changed it, um, and I threw about, uh, out some things and I put in some things. And as I did it, tests were failing and failing. And that's the type of thing you're gonna do in your homework as well, right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm first of all, just gonna go to this script and that's like an overall script that's called run tests. Okay, so a script that runs all the unit tests in this project. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. Let's even exit the system to kind of start with a clean REPL just to be safe. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. And as this is running, I must say that if you're actually doing package development, you might do this in project two or project three, they're, they're slightly cleaner ways of doing tests. There's a package test or JL, and there's kind of a cl slightly cleaner methodology, but it does what we're doing here only in a slightly more organized way. However, there is enough order here. We just didn't want to throw too many built-in things. So what you're seeing here is, is, is just some output that's supposed to make you feel good, right? So pass, 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 pass. And as you're going to start to make changes to the project, things are going to fail. And as they fail, you'll try to isolate them, see where they fail, find where they fail, and then make them pass. Okay, so let's look at some of those things. So let's actually go to, um, so what this is doing is including subfiles. Okay, there are some integers tests. Let's look at polynomial tests. So this is including the file polynomial test. And polynomial test just has a few functions. And each of these functions, what they do is they run. And the way we did it here, they print out something in the end and say, hey, we passed, happy, passed. So where, where do these fail? Where are these functions gonna fail if there's a problem? What, what, how would I know if my tests don't pass? Yeah. The assert. The assert, right. So what we did here, and that's not the most common clean way to do it, but it's, it's, it's good enough for our purposes, is we put in line 19 and in line 27, some asserts, and these are truths that must hold in the program as these things run, okay? So let's, let's look at one, for example. Okay, look, look at this. What we're doing here is we're running over N, which by default is a thousand random polynomials, okay? If I do rand polynomial, I get a random polynomial. Here's another random one, and here's another random one. We, look, we might look at the source for that, sir. I'm creating the product polynomial and I'm doing the exact test, which I actually did visually with you when I looked at the product, right? I'm just looking that the leading term of the product is the product of the two leading terms. That is in no way a conclusive grade test for product polynomials, right? There can be so many other bugs in the polynomials that won't be caught here, okay? I hope there aren't, okay? This should be without, this should be working, okay? So the, the one good thing is that there are other, there's other code afterwards that uses products as well. 
right, the factorization, etc. Right. So, but if, for example, I would just let's just add now uh, plus um, the. I think I have. Look, there's a function which we call the one of polynomial. That's like the unit polynomial. That's a polynomial one times x to the power zero. That's the one. Okay. So let's add plus one polynomial. Now, when you're working with such things, when you add, when you do this, right, I need to know, okay, if I've, if I've made a change to this file, well, it uh, depends what I'm going to run, but maybe I want to run this file, maybe not, okay? In this case, it doesn't matter because I'm just going to run tests and run tests will include the file. I just need to make sure it's saved, okay? And here, we, we, we now failed, okay? So, and it says assertion error in this line, and it's very important to know how to go to this line, and then I go and then I can find the assert. Now, then you might ask yourself, okay, I've got some mistake, I've got some assertion. Well, I, I mean, well, I knew we know where the assertions are because the product uh, leading of a polynomial is not the product of leading plus one. But let's say for some reason I thought it is. Okay, so now I want to catch this. You can work in all kinds of different ways. The dirty way is you might then add some code, and there are better ways, but this is, this is it's, at least it's, it's good to have one way as opposed to zero ways. You might add some code such as if this is not true, okay? Because assert is always asserts that something is correct. Or if you want, you could have put a not on this, right? So if your assert condition is not true, then maybe at show P1, at show P2, at show prod and and now right it, because it might be in this case this failed probably on the first polynomial of this loop but look I'm testing here a, a thousand polynomials maybe it would have only failed on the polynomial 757 right so I don't want to I just want to show it that second I want to catch that instance that fails before this thing fails and now when I'll run the test It tells me this is P1, this is P2, this is a product. And then I see the assertion error. So at this point, I might go and debug this, okay? However, when you do these types of things, and I, I think you'll understand what I mean once you get into it, some of you already do, then you actually want to find the minimal or something that's close to the minimal failing thing, right? So these are rather complicated polynomials. And you ask, hey, what's actually happening here? And you might be able to find it, and you will. Okay, let's do a bunch of undos here. Okay, so you've got tests. So that was the third way of, of running this code. And it's just seeing that the tests pass. And you'll, I think you add a few tests of your own, but as you make the changes, you'll just do also clones of these tests to the other types that you create. Okay. All right, let's look at some code. Are there any questions, any thoughts? Oh, I'm not seeing the chat, sorry. So nothing, okay. Let me check. All right. So let's let's start and actually look at the at the main code and let's look at the um, back at the source. And if you look at the source, it's kind of broken up into basic polynomial operations folder that has a few files. There is the polynomial factorization folder that actually has only one file. And there is then the polynomial.jl and term.jl. So let's actually start with term, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll overview now the two data types that we supply, but you're gonna supply new ones. And you're gonna vary these, term and polynomial. So, and this, this just builds on directly on what uh, Andy has taught you in the past couple of lectures, okay? And this, this is kind of the example that you'll be dealing with in the context of computer algebra systems. So struct term, is term mutable or immutable? Immutable, right? So types in Julia are by default immutable unless we put immutable. And there's no reason to put immutable on this. It's such a small thing. It's really just a tuple of a term is just a coefficient in a degree, right? So a term is a single terminate polynomial. We know what that is mathematically. And this function here is a constructor, is a constructor, okay? So let's try and, and do term of 10, negative three. Well, 
we get degree must be non-negative and that was this error condition, okay? All right, so that constructs a term, but this one didn't construct a term. Of course, we can then do term of, of two, seven, and that's two times x to the seven. Okay, and then you get a bunch of these one line functions. Okay, and the, these functions are a bit, I, I, I find them kind of a bit of advanced, a bit special, not in the, in the sense that they're one line, but in the fact that the type that zero gets, zero doesn't get an integer or a float or something like that. It actually gets a thing which is in its own right, a data type, but it works for the data type, which is of type term. Okay, so if you do zero of term, you get the zero term, zero times x to the power zero, right? And we need to be careful here because what about the term um, zero times x to the power seven? So here was already a design choice when we, when we created this thing. Zero times x to the power seven, is that the same as zero times x to the power zero? Let's see. Well, it looks it looks the same, and indeed, what we did what we did in line twenty one in the constructor for term, we said if the coefficient is not zero, then create the new. The new, by the way, Andy said this, but just a, new is a keyword used in the constructor, okay, in inner constructors. So, the, so this is a new term of coefficient degree. Otherwise, if coefficient is zero, then just new coefficient zero. Okay. All right, um, so that's that's a zero. And of course, just like you saw previously, there, the zero function is not something that we invented. Julia already came with 33 zero functions. The zero for an in, zero for a float, zero for all kinds of things. We did the zero for a term, okay? One is the same thing. Now here's a show. What does show do? You saw this just about an hour ago. Yeah. It's great a string, right? Yeah. How, how do you do this in Python? Somebody must know. Uh, yeah. Right. There's a there's like a an underscore star which would do the same type of thing, right? So, so when we now display this, when I do the term two times x to the power ten, and I see this, this dot is here, right? If I want to change it, let's do for example times here. Okay, so when you do the pretty printing, it'll be this type of stuff, right? So let's run this source again, and then term, you see, I just changed change the way it's displayed, right? Um, I don't like this X, so let's go back to it, to the dot, okay? And that's, that's here, the Unicode dot, which you just got like that. Now you've got all kinds of query functions, and this is also a Julia function well, there are many, many methods of this function, but this is just a query, is it zero? That's just shorthand for things. Are two terms less than each other? Okay, so this is how we, com we compare terms. We compare them based on the degree. There's evaluating the terms. Now we get to this, the plus. And somebody asked about commutativity. You'll see that in a second, right? So, well, when we're adding two different things. So, um, so this is adding a term in a term. So when we add two terms, first of all, we're not allowed to add terms that are of a different degree, okay? We could have done that there would have been a plus of two terms of a different degree that would actually give you a polynomial, but that's not how we designed this thing, okay? So we designed it that if you add two terms that are of a different degree, it doesn't work. You can add two polynomials that have terms of different degrees, okay? There's a minus. Now, we're not going to do minus in a too complicated way. We just it's we just do minus in terms of a plus, right? And in some of the things you do, you also want to do that, right? So you want to kind of reuse code, right? So that's um, that's that's sorry, that's just a minus of a term. Sorry, I, I sorry. This is negation. That's not minus. That's minusing. That's negating a term. But this is minus on two terms. Okay, so that's a binary operation. That's a term plus minus that term. There's multiplication of terms and there's modulo of terms, modulo P, where P, what you're doing is you're doing modulo on the coefficient, okay? And here, when we get to this derivative functionality, all it is is this is a derivative rule for a term. So a derivative of a term is you take the coefficient and then you um, 
for the power to be what, what it was before, minus one. Okay, now this is the first ugly bit of code. Uh, am I correct here? Let's see. Um, yes, so let's do term n8 divided div ab by term say two six. Okay. The way this library comes to you is in the fact that functions like division or GCD, they don't actually return a term of their own. They return this type of thing, which is a function. And that function then depends on an integer. And the integer would be typically the prime in the residue class where you're working. And Paul Verbeek will explain this more. But just when you see this from a code perspective, look, look at what's happening here. So th this is a return value, right? We could have been a bit more generous and we would have written return here. Okay, this is a return value. The return value is a function that takes an integer, returns a term, and actually constructs a, a term, but that constructed term depends on, on P, on that integer. So that, that's a bit complicated. So you'll see that happening with the divisions and, and the GCD. And you'll understand why when, once, you, once you look more into the code, okay? But this is kind of a first warning on, on things ahead. So that happens in, in multiple places in this code base where you've got functions that, so also with a polynomial. So if I do like the polynomial x squared plus three x uh, plus two divided by the polynomial x plus seven, for example, X is not defined. Let's just put our X in the system. Okay, so what I got is I actually got a function. So to actually use this function, well, let's let's put, let's call it div ans equals this. That's a division answer. So div ans, I can then put some prime, for example, 101, and then it gave the answer to th this division problem modulo 101. So you'll always be working with polynomials uh, where the coefficients are rings of zp. So numbers up to 0, 1, 2, up to 100, or up to a prime, and you, you'll, you'll get that. So that's the one level of complication that is to understand this as a user. But if, if, if you don't understand this now, don't, don't, let, don't let me stop you from, well, don't let that stop you from starting the project, because there's just a lot of software bits that you can already do in the project. And by the way, the break is over. You had quiz last Tuesday. <laughs> now it's time to start the project. Uh, it's going to be an intense couple of weeks. All right. So that's the video. And that's it. That's what we had for terms. So we went over the file term, or at least got, got a feel for what's there. So let's look at the next, uh, the next major important file, and that's polynomial. OK. So polynomial, struct polynomial. <laughs> <clears throat> now here things get a bit complicated. So when we have these structs and you'll have objects in memory that are polynomial, we have all kinds of assumptions about what happens with this struct. So there's all kinds of invariants, all kinds of rules of what you expect that struct to be. For example, one of the, this struct is actually a dense polynomial. So I'll just show you, um, let's just create a, a random one, p equals rand poly, rand polynomial, sorry. So here we've got a pretty big polynomial here, okay? Polynomial here, look, in, in terms of struct, I mean, you saw previously cats and dogs and crocodiles, but now you've got polynomial. This polynomial seems simple, right? There's only a terms, only a vector of terms. I mean, that's where you expect the polynomial to be, right? Out the back, it's a vector of terms, okay? And this function is a constructor. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. But if you do p dot terms, let's look at that vector. Well, here, is, here are the elements of this vector. Okay. Oh, it's doing times. I, I changed the time. So that's okay. It's just uh, running it on the previous time. Let's run term again. And then we'll get the times in, in the way it, it will appear to you in the project when you do that. Okay, 
So this, this representation already has something. So let's, let, let's observe. So the first term is 49 times x to the power zero. The second one is zero to the power, zero times x to the power zero. You could have had that this is x to the power one. And you could have had here that this is x to the power three. Or you could have even had, you'd look at this and you say, hey, you tell me, hey, Yoni, this is wasteful. Why are you even having the powers? Because it's kind of obvious, right? If I'm doing this representation, then I might as well just have had just the coefficients, right? So look, the polynomial, look at the polynomial. Let's make a different one, x to the power 100, p dot terms. It's got a bunch of zeros and then a one here at 100, okay? Or if I would have done, Uh, p, p equals 10 times x to the power 100. Sorry, the 10 has to be straight close to this or I need it times. Okay, 10, then, uh, then when I do p dot terms, right, I've only got a 10. So you could, you could say that this is wasteful and you're right, but you're gonna improve it, okay? So this is a dense representation of terms. And it actually has a list of terms, which is sometimes a bit redundant, but actually still makes it easy to work with programmatically. You'll see when you inspect the code in greater detail. So we only have like two or three minutes, but what I wanna say is when you read this documentation around the vector of terms, it actually states a whole bunch of assumptions in regards to what we have in this vector. For example, there is an assumption that the end of the vector is always gonna be a non-zero term. Okay, so you're not gonna suddenly have a vector that has more zeros afterwards. And we actually have to work to make that. So the way we did this here is there's this other method called trim exclamation mark. You already know the exclamation mark notation in Julia, okay? And what this trim does is it gives polynomial a haircut and it says, if there are too many terms beyond that are zero, it's gonna delete them, okay? Anything that does something with polynomials in this implementation is going to apply trim, okay? So let's just look at the example just before we finish. So if we go to polynomial addition, for example, this is a function plus that currently adds two polynomials. When you make your own type of polynomials, you actually have to change these functions a bit, right? So you're not just changing the struct, you're changing the method implementation to deal with the struct. So what this thing does is, Oh, sorry, so this is add a polynomial with a term. So we're saying, if the degree of this term is greater than the degree of the, the polynomial, well, then just push it in there. Now, push in its own right, it's not just push into the next thing, it's actually gonna push some zeros in between if needed. So push in its own right is also, we have a method for push and for polynomial. Otherwise, stick it someplace in between, but then in the end, we actually apply this trim. Okay, so what I want to finish here by saying is just that there's this type actually has invariance, actually has these kind of rules that, that adhere to it. So after you make pretty printing, which I think all of you will survive easily, okay, so you'll make polynomials appear nicely. I think the next task you're gonna go on to is, of course, you can come to consultation hours and tutorials, et cetera, et cetera. So the next task is, is gonna be refactoring the data structure used. And in this task, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get rid of this. Well, you're actually gonna keep it. You're just gonna make a new type, which is like this type, but it's not gonna be called polynomial, it'll be called polynomial sparse. And just to be clean, you also rename polynomial to polynomial dense. So you'll actually have two types and duplicate the tests. So both tests run for both and they should act the same. Polynomial sparse is not gonna have this huge wasteful list where polynomial X to the power 1000 actually allocates a thousand terms. So we'll only have a few, okay? So that's the type of stuff used. And the last thing I wanna say is that the practical this week, um, practical F, you'll be a bit, it's actually worth doing. So it does something that's not the type of thing that you're doing in the project, it deals with rational functions, ratios of two polynomials. But by analogy, if you follow the details of this practical, you'll see how to make polynomials multiply. Are there any questions? No, 7 p.m., difficult time. 
Um, all right, you can really get cracking on project one. Of course, there are things that you'll still, still learn from Paul Verbeek and then lecture tomorrow and next week, um, but enjoy. Consultation hours are still Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. There's also the special uh, meeting with Ivana uh, Thursdays at two uh, for those that are newer to coding and Friday at two with me via Zoom. And that's it. Have a good night.